Good evening. My name is Michael Lonsborough, and it's my great privilege to welcome you to this evening's fourth Czech Centre's Global Scientific Cafe. So, a bit about Czech Centres. So, the Czech Centres are part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, and as such, they have an international network of 22 um, offices around the world, over three continents, and they're charged with promoting Czech uh, culture, Czech innovation, and Czech history. And that's it. this evening we have a fascinating mixture. We're going to be talking about something, some aspects of Czech history, certainly some Czech innovation, and of course some science and technology coming from the Czech Republic. In a, an area which is, uh, of course, relevant to all of us, is, is gaming, uh, computer gaming. And uh, today we have with us a, a startup from the Czech Republic called Charles Games. And they've got some fantastic new projects which we'll be talking about. I'd like to start off with a short clip of their latest uh, game that you can all download and play yourself. So please, can we have a look at the clip? Odboj, to přece byla vlastenecká povinnost. Pak dědu odvedli a já jsem si nikdy nemyslela, že ho uvidím až po válce. Proč vašeho dědu zatkli, to jsme se vlastně nikdy nedopátrali. Byl to zlej sen. Takže se ani nedivím tvému dědečkovi, že o tom nechce mluvit. So that was the award-winning game Attentat 1942, developed by Charles Games. And I'm very proud to say that we have here two of the, the founding members of, of uh, Charles Games. It's uh, Mr. Jakub uh, Gemroth here on, on, my, on my far side and Vitek Schisler. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for, for joining us. Thanks. Um, uh, Jakub is a, a game a development lecturer uh, at Charles University, hence Charles Games and also is, of course, the, the co-founder of Charles Games. And uh, Vitek is an assistant professor of media studies, also at Charles University, and, uh, of course, as well, the co-founder of Charles Games. Uh, gentlemen, congratulations on your award-winning effort with Attentat 1942. Let's begin. Why, why Attentat 1942? Why 1942? What's, what's the story behind the game? Well, uh, <clears throat> Attentat 1942, it's a... Uh... It's a serious, uh, historically accurate video game about the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia. And essentially, the game tells you the story of Second World War through quite unusual perspective in video games. It tells you the story through the perspective of civilians and, and ordinary people. And the whole game um, revolves around um, what happened after the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich, who was like a uh, Reich's protector of the uh, occupied Czechoslovakia and one of the lead architects of the Holocaust. And in 1942, he was assassinated by, Czech and, by Czechoslovak paratroopers uh, sent from, from, uh, from UK. And after his death, uh, the Nazis started a wave of brutal reprisals, resulting in thousands of deaths and deportations. And our game actually tells the story, not of the assassination itself, which is kind of well known, well-known story, but it tells the story of normal people living in Prague under occupation, dealing with the Nazi reprisals and its aftermath. So what were the, what's the, the central idea? Why were you wanting to tell this particular story? I can understand that this has got a, a, a direct relevance to where we're sitting now in Prague, a direct relevance to the Czech nation, or Czechoslovakian nation, as it was then. 
uh, perhaps even reflects on, on aspects of your own family. But what's the real reason why you chose this particular story? Well, the whole project actually started um, as kind of educational one. We initially developed uh, the game as an educational simulation for high schools. And the reason behind that was that uh, there was, at the time we started, there was not that many uh, innov innovative and like aids for teachers, how to teach our contemporary history. And we think that this, our contemporary history, especially the second half of the 20th century, which is fundamentally shaping our present. So we kind of wanted to, to have that. And also uh, in terms of like, uh, then the game actually developed into full-fledged video game, which is now being sold worldwide. So it's not, not used in educational content anymore. It's like a game you can buy on Steam and it won several awards. But uh, I think like video games are a great medium for telling stories. And they can, they're capable of telling even the most serious and intimate human stories. Okay. Jakub, maybe you can tell us something about why is the gaming experience so useful for educational purposes? Yeah, uh, so uh, the game uh, itself uh, is interactive. So uh, you need to take part in it naturally. Uh, so it's not like um, you're passively uh, receiving information. Uh, our game is forcing you to, to process them uh, and recombine uh, them, re reconstruct the, the stories out of the bits which are shared by, by different characters uh, within, within the game. And so uh, through uh, this uh, interaction, uh, you becoming immersed and uh, as, as the human brain is, is working, uh, you will easily mm, memorize or uh, the things you will learn from the game will stay with you for a longer period of time that way. Certainly when, when I, I had a, a quick, thank you very much for the link, I had, I had a quick go myself. And uh, I, I definitely was able to, you know, really immerse myself into the story. And I think for me, what was the most important aspect of the game was to, to see, to, to, you know, to be able to determine with whom I'll be speaking, which, with which characters I'll be speaking, what questions I would like to ask, in what way I'd like to ask them. So I did actually feel like I was in a, in a direct contact with people who were from that time in that story. And, and I, I did feel very much submerged into the story. So I think there's, there's definitely that, that sort of psychological aspect of it, which is, which is relevant to, to learning. This game has, has led to you know, a good level of success. Tell me a bit about the international feedback that you're, you're getting. Well, the game was uh, pretty successful, actually. Uh, it won the, it was the Czech game of the year in 2017. And, it's, and we won the uh, most amazing game at MA's festival in Berlin. And uh, actually we've been nominated to independent games festival in IGF in San Francisco, which is probably the, the, major, uh, the major success of the game. So, so far the, the international feedback has been really good to our game. Congratulations. And who's playing, who's playing this game the most? I mean, it, how are you distributing it? Is it mainly schools? Is the educational aspect the most important? Is it schools wanting to, to play, play with it with their students? Or is it very much individuals who are, who are downloading and, and, and playing? Yeah, so with the Attentat, uh, there are uh, individuals downloading it and playing it. Uh, of course, uh, we are propagating it also uh, in the, to the educational sector. Uh, but the attentat uh, uh, is aimed uh, at uh, regular players, but it's a bit a niche game, of course. It's not uh, in the mainstream productions like uh, platformers, uh, let's say, or RPGs, uh, MMOs. Uh, so uh, it's usually played uh, by the players uh, who are fond of history and want to know want to know more. But uh, from the festivals where uh, we have been showing the game to the general general public. Um, we have uh, seen various people interacting with our games, even like uh, kids of age like 12 or, or 11. And uh, they have been able to uh, digest the, the story and uh, become immersed to it and play it for a longer period of time. So uh, I think the, the game can be really played uh, by, by many and enjoyed by many. Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's talk a bit more about the game itself. Mm -hmm. So you've established for all of us that it's about the, the assassination of, of uh, Heinrich uh, here in, in Prague in, in 1942, and then the consequences that then ensued 
the, the, the payback that was, uh, you know, put on to the, the, Czech, the Czechoslovakian people at the time. So what happens in the game? What's the, what's the, the, the primary goal of the game for the individual who starts playing, the actual player? Actually, in the game, you follow a personal story. You play a grandson or granddaughter of a postal clerk in the Helinek who was uh, arrested by Gestapo immediately after the assassination. And he was actually sent to the camps. And after the war, he returned. And he never really talked much why he was arrested, what, what really happened. So kind of in the family, there is like kind of this mystery that everybody knows he was in the camp and he had something to do with the assassination. But he never really kind of talked about that. And then uh, you play the game, actually, in the game, you can't replay the past, so you don't play the actual events in 1942. But instead of you play the game in present time, which is the game time is like 2001, and you discover by like some normal kind of conversation uh, when your grandma is actually moving to a new flat, you discover that he was you know arrested and the whole the whole story, and you actually and your grandfather is in hospital, he's not really talking much at the time, and so you try to kind of figure out what really happened, what role did he play in the attack? What role did he play in the resistance? So you start to talk to your relatives, to his colleagues and friends. Uh, you go through his diaries and historical materials and kind of you try to figure out and put a story. An important thing is that the game uh, is, uh, is polyphonic, meaning that you talk to different people and depending on who you talk to and how you frame your question and what you are asking, you will kind of discover different layers of the story. And also each person is presenting to you with kind of significantly different evaluation of the past. So they present you not only with different stories, but with different historical perspectives. Did Mr. Jelinek really live? That's a good question, no. Uh, and so the game is uh, based on real historical research and on real testimonies. So we actually closely collaborated with historians from the Institute of Contemporary History of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And in our game, they were not just like consultants like in many projects, but they were actually the game designers. They were really involved in creating dialogues and everything. So we, uh, so the game strives to be historically accurate, but mainly for ethical and, and legal and also didactical reasons, the characters and their stories are fictitious. Right, so it's a yeah. fictitious story which you are part of in the context of a real yep. historical event, yep. which happened yep. here, of course. And, so, and you mentioned in that part the, the, the uh, collaboration you had with the scientific histo you know, yep. historical institutes here in the Czechoboat. So tell us a bit about that, that collaboration between scientific institutions and yourself in the development of the game. Well, I mean, the game was originally developed uh, even before Charles Games were established. So we, where we are developing the game, we are kind of still part of Charles University and Charles Games is still co-owned co by Charles University. So like there was a natural uh, collaboration between us in the Czech Academy, Czech Academy of Sciences. And the collaboration in the beginning was uh, not easy, I would say. It was a very uh, ambitious project, you know, to we approach professional historians who are used to, you know, like uh, very rigorous uh, yes. academic way of uh, writing. And we approached them, we would like to make a fictitious game based on real research and based on these testimonies, but it will be a game. And they were very, uh, they're kind of skeptical in the beginning, yes. saying like that, like they're really afraid of schematizations and you know various false interpretations, but I think we kind of gradually convinced them that the, the medium of video games is capable of delivering you know authentic uh, and historically accurate stories, but it took some time. So it's an investigative, investigative, uh, an investigation type game. Um, Jakub, you were mentioning the interact, the interactive mm. component of the game. So let's talk a bit about that. So we're, we're in this uh, historical uh, context. We're, we're playing the role. We are the, the granddaughter or grandson of, of Mr. Jelinek. We've come back. We want to learn more about them. OK, so we're, we're meeting people, mm -hmm. uh, learning more information from them. That, that, in a sense, is also an interactiveness with the, because as you said, you can actually choose how you ask questions. But what else is in there which is interactive? Yeah. Yeah, not only when you are talking uh, uh, with um, th those uh, witnesses, uh, you sometimes uh, relive part of their uh, memories uh, through the interactive mini games, which is not like only about uh, dialogue, uh, but there are some scenes uh, where you basically uh, having some kind of a goal, like for instance. Um, the Reinhardt uh, has been assassinated, and uh, now the Gestapo is storming through the flats uh, in, in Prague. And um, you are afraid uh, that you are having some something at, at home that can be labeled as... Um, uh, 
suspicious. Oh, so, suspicious, yeah. And so, so you're really afraid that you will be sent to concentration camps or uh, executed. So uh, you're put into the foot uh, of uh, you know, such, such eyewitnesses, and um, you have to choose which item to throw out and which which to keep, and. That's how uh, in the game uh, we want to get into the player's heart right. uh, and start them thinking, okay, if I was in this position, what would I do? And, and of course, uh, the atmosphere of, of fear uh, will overwhelm you and you usually start like throwing everything out because you don't know the context for, for many of those items. And I suppose that is the true education of the system, that you actually, uh, whereas, you know, thinking back to school times, learning about such, a, such an event, you only really hear about the main historically relevant characters, you know, the real yep. protagonist and antagonist and the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the dates and, and specifics. Whereas this is much more of a, I suppose, an education in the sense of you're emotionally, mm. uh, provide, you're providing an emotional experience for the player. So they know what it was like to emotionally live through that as just a normal person within that, that, that period. I think also what is important is like typically Typically in Czech Republic, like mostly, this is not a uh, case in all the time, but mostly history is still kind of perceived and taught as a list of, you know, important dates and events. And we wanted to, through our game, we wanted to show uh, that history is also, you know, there are concrete, real people's stories, like ordinary people who lived through the time and they made decisions which created history. So it's kind of like you see history more like as, as, like an, as a plastic kind of, uh, uh, that there are real people living through these times and yes. they, they made decisions under certain circumstances, which you know, uh, the game tries to to. So I kind of so you're not you're not just learning not just learning about the actual historical uh, what what happened, but you're learning how to deal with such conditions, how you emotionally would react under, under such conditions. Exactly. Yeah, sort of. It's it's like so it's, it's very emotional. What, yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, it's more like understanding why. It's more about the game. Is I would say understanding why these people or why different people made certain decisions and why they are, for example, today they are defending their decisions. And they are trying to, to justify what they did. And this game kind of provides you with uh, explanation or some kind of experience. And what's the, what's the end game? What's the, mm. what's the ultimate goal for the grandson or granddaughter of Mr. Jelinek? Well, actually, uh, well, alert, maybe. Yeah, I, 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 I won't tell because uh, it's okay. a spoiler. So <laughs> yeah. the, actually, the, the story reaches, uh, I would say, quite surprising conclusion. Which is again based uh, as I like based on real stories. So like typically the main game arc uh, in in Attentat is actually loosely based on you know several testimonies we we collected, and there is a there is kind of a, there is kind of end of the story. But I don't want to spoil. Okay, uh, for, no, that's fair enough. Yeah, so for the viewers. But okay, but so now then, as as I as I mentioned previously, the this well, as you talked about indeed that this game was awarded not only. Uh, prizes here in the Czech Republic, but also in Germany, and then indeed it qualified into being uh, part of the the competition in America. Uh, so, what, according to you, do you think is the secret of your success? What are the elements of the game which made it, you know, s such a successful uh, product? I think, if, if I may, uh, that uh, it's the it's like the seriousness and and it, it's kind of a serious and major topic. I think we, we came with our game at a specific point of time where the audience was kind of looking for looking forward to play games which are serious and, 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 uh, and accurate. And there are not that many games like that. And especially there is like there are thousands of games which deal with war and, and but most of them focus on uh, on the military perspective. They provide you with the kind of you can relive the memories of soldiers and you know and, and there is a focus on combat and the technology of war is, and we want in our game we are showing radically different perspective, which is the civilian perspective of war and trauma of war, and, and there are not that many games. Uh, I mean, I would say doing that uh, for the first time and for the first point. And the second point is that I think in the game uh, you kind of see that there was a lot of uh, uh, the game is quite complex, and I would say it's, it's trying to not to be schematizing, not to you know provide you with. Uh, Kind of huge narratives is very like very down to earth, realistic because it's based on the real testimonies and, and data we have, and I think you players kind of appreciate that the the, the accuracy or realisticness of of the, of the stories we are mm -hmm. we, we, our historians constructed. Uh, I, I was also add that uh, 
gaming wise we really really believe that the player will be able to reconstruct uh, the the story and that's not um, really typical if you want to create a fun game then um, the your best uh, shot is to really guide the player carefully mm -hmm. so he won't stuck anywhere but um, with with us, so really throw it to to the player. Okay, we will tell you a few things, but it's up to you to reconstruct the the whole story, and that's um, unusual, definitely. So I think that was also apprised by, by by critics, which picked our picked our game because there is a lot of con content and the polyphony, and um, more you think about uh, the game, more. Uh, more connections and links you, you you usually discover. So I think um, the the critics uh, might have been surprised by by this. So okay, so let's well, let's follow on from that and let's talk a bit about the process of development of the game development. And what were the if you think back now, I'd like to. I'm interested to know a bit about how it all began. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what were the first the seeds of the idea? And how did you actually kick it off? How did you take that original idea and actually begin to bring it into fruition? And also, what were the greatest challenges thereafter mm. in getting it from that uh, initial idea phase to finishing with a you know a, you know a product? Yep, uh, I think definitely the uh, like we've been involved in like development of serious games or educational games for so quite a long time so like we had experience at uh, uh, Charles University and for a long time we knew we wanted to do a game about our contemporary story and also for me for example for, for personal reasons because my, my family was deeply affected by by both the Second World War and then the, the communist times so it was kind of long I like long time we had this idea and finally, when we got the resources and like kind of capacities to, to start that, we approached the historians. And definitely there were like hours and hours, maybe days and days of discussions, how to approach that, you know, how to approach the topic through the medium of video game. And the biggest challenge, I would say, it's, um, uh, it's very similar to when you do any kind of historical work. Uh, there is a, a, a question of selection, essentially like any historical enterprise. It's, there is a necessity to, to to choose because you have a continuum of historical facts, like you have thousands of of, of of fates and you know stories, and you have to choose or pick a few stories and a few characters and elevate them to the main story. And among historians, there are like really endless discussions: what should be emphasized and what should be omitted, mm -hmm. because there was simply no space and time and resources to. So we actually decided that we'll not uh, uh, like we'll pick only eight characters, but then we're like really very carefully selecting which stories, which, which background we'll select. And we really tried, we really tried hard to present you with very like various and multifaceted uh, view on history. So for example, you can talk to people who, who are local survivors. You can talk to people who have been in the resistance movement, so been like actively, you know, uh, fighting against the Nazis. But then you can talk to people who were not necessarily collaborators, but who are kind of actively engaged with the regime. And they are still living there, and, and, and you can see their stories and why they did what they did, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's, I think, that's uh, this kind of like polyphony was a really first challenge, like what to select and what to omit. And I think we succeeded particularly because we had a very diverse team of historians. So like, there was always, you know, opposition and, and peer view. But ultimately, you must have had to made very hard decisions yep. which characters you, you should be sympathetic towards. And which you should not. I mean, um, let's take for the, 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 the example of, it's easy to be uh, you know, very positive about a, a hero who stands up against the oppressors. But perhaps, the, as you said, maybe people who, and there must have been very many, who just wanted the quiet life, didn't want to sort of stand out, didn't want to, and you know, how to, how to that develop those characters so there's a, a degree of sympathy. Well, the thing is that the game doesn't uh, force you some opinion. Like the game presents you with different stories, with different you know uh, characters, and it's up to you to critically evaluate what they tell you mm. and to figure out like what you what sense you will make of it. And it's very that's a very important aspect of the game. It's based on constructivism. Like we show you the material, and it's up to you to really, you have to really critically assess it. And as for the uh, sympathy, the game is like. Uh, 
there is, the game definitely doesn't justify what happened, but really kind of, uh, I think it helps you to understand why certain people did certain decisions, including, for example, those who kind of are engaged with the regime. And I think that's maybe from what we hear from people playing it, this character is one of the like one of the kind of strongest character for many players because they say like that kind of the the uh, the kind of trauma of you know totalitarian regime or the kind of the, the power of the regime is shown through the people who, who broke or who you know who kind of uh, yes yeah uh, and th th then you sh then you kind of see the the, the, the horror and the, what, yeah. what what the fear and the kind of uh, yes. Yeah, uh, the the pressure, uh, the, the 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 duress, you know, these people have been uh, been been under. So, uh, this character, actually, especially in schools, is very pretty much appreciated that because it opens a lot of questions about yeah. you know about uh, bravery and and moral choices, etc. Okay, so that that's the difficulty and some of the challenges in developing the storyline. Um, Jakub, could you tell us a bit about the some of the the challenges in developing the other aspects of the game? Yeah, so, so I was a lead programmer. I was uh, hired to uh, assemble a team uh, of, de of developers who will uh, make this. And um, the biggest challenge for, uh, in this respect probably was uh, that uh, we didn't really know what, uh, how the product will look in the end. Yeah, uh, as uh, Vitek said, uh, that was discussed a, a lot, so the, the final... Uh, st um, a final game <laughs> will be uh, will, uh, what it will be like, and uh, we er even made jokes about that. Uh, we finally have final specification finalized, <laughs> and it was like constantly changing. Uh, so um, the challenge uh, was to be as agile and flexible uh, in developing a technical solution for this as, uh, as possible. Because we had also um, many people working um, uh, online. And uh, at uh, that time when we have been developing uh, Attentat, uh, there were no good online game editors of the sort. So we actually made uh, our, our own uh, online editor. So we could have, for instance, like testers testing from, from their home uh, what we have been uh, integ uh, integrating, like creating with, within the editor. And uh, at that time, I consider this uh, to uh, be quite uh, quite a success that it, it have worked. And uh, tell us about once you've got the, you've got the game done, you've finished all, you've, you know, you've solved all the, the, the challenges, you've got something which you're happy with, and you're, you're distributing via, via Steam, right? And so, was was that an, an easy thing to easy format to go through? Or? <laughs> yeah, so so, so uh, that was the time when we still didn't have Charles Games. So uh, we have been publishing uh, the game under Charles University. So the Charles University uh, had to um, enter uh, into the legal contract with the Steam as a game publisher. That was kind of like a funny point that uh, we make. Uh, Charles University to become a publisher of, of games uh, when we have released uh, the attentat. And uh, one thing uh, when we were doing this um, was that Steam asked uh, for uh, a document uh, which Charles University was uh, based upon, like a f former, um, former, uh, for formal, formal document. And there simply doesn't, it simply doesn't exist or exist in the 14th century. So we sent them a copy of a historical document where in Latin it was stated oh, that, the yeah, yeah, uh, that Ch Charles University was, was founded and they replied us, okay, is this uh, some kind of a joke or something? <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> this Charles University really originated from 14th century. But in the end, uh, it, it went all, um, all good. So, so uh, we got our our account uh, uh, created. Uh, I see, so, so for practical reasons then, because of this problem <laughs> such as uh, coming from a, an establishment which is dated from the 14th century, yeah. uh, you, so you, span, you, you, you created this Czech Games uh, unit. This, this, uh, you founded that and, and that's enabled you then to act a lot more quickly and in, in, a, in a more mobile, flexible yeah. sense, right? And so, and in the Czech Republic, of course, you're, you're quite unique in this. I mean, is there any other gaming establishments 
that they're producing their own their own uh, by university? No, no, no. I don't think so. Definitely. No. So, well, so this is an interesting so this is an interesting sort of development or an innovation, and, and because you're both very, of course, you're still active academically. Uh, so I can see straight away. I can see all sorts of uh, possibilities when you've got this Charles Games. Mm. You're both, of course, affiliated still with Charles University. I, I assume that they're delighted that you've 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 made this spin-off, uh, which they have, a, I presume, a, a, you know, yeah, a, a, an, an equity in. And yep. so, uh, tell me a bit about how you can use that as a vehicle to develop things further. I mean, in terms of what you're doing at the university and what you're doing at Charles Games. Yeah. Okay. okay, so like Charles Games is actually kind of, uh, it was like Charles University was very supportive uh, of, of this startup. It actually, they, they, they co-founded it and they, they co-own it. And, and they see it like as an exactly opportunity to, you know, kind of uh, create a unit which is far more flexible uh, in, you know, entering the international game market than university itself because you know, university is not really entity kind of designed for, you know, producing and selling games. So uh, Charles Games is a like, kind of public-private partnership, and it has three pillars. Like one pillar is that we continue developing serious games, historically accurate games, like which are based on our research and our firmer projects. Then a second part of Charles Games is a student incubator, and Jakub can talk about it. It kind of like serves as a incubator for there's like a game video game development program at Charles University, and Charles Games is kind of like incubator for for young teams who. Try, want to try enter the, the market. And the third pillar of Charles Games is that we are developing educational games uh, which are like tailored for, for customers who, who need some kind of specific, specific solution. So develop a bit further that second pillar of, mm. of the incubator, the student in incubator. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm uh, leading a master specialization of computer game development at Charles University. Uh, there is actually a computer science school which is very well developed at the Faculty of Math and uh, Physics. And there we are having uh, game, dev, uh, game dev education. And um, one thing uh, is that uh, we are running computer games development course where really we assemble an uh, interdisciplinary uh, team of, of students from different actually institutions and they are creating their small games. And sometimes uh, there are people who would like to continue uh, with that, even like after after studies, or um, uh, in in the, uh, in the uh, like during uh, their, their studies. But uh, they um, they want to try find, for instance, a publisher or investor or enter the market and sell sell their game. They really have the the spirit uh, of uh, getting into the business, and uh, there aren't. Uh, there isn't um, any incubator focusing on games in Czech Republic yet. So that's why uh, we see this as an opp opportunity to uh, help those students to, to get to conferences, uh, do the real uh, pitching of, of their game ideas to, to, to real publishers to really see what uh, the game development business uh, is, uh, is about. But it's uh, very competitive and you need to be a uh, business professional. Uh, and um, that's what um, standard regular ed education cannot uh, uh, give you, give you uh, per se, because you need um, money uh, to, to invest to, to students to, to send them uh, send them abroad. So uh, if uh, we see a potential uh, in a in a game that uh, it could sell uh, eventually, we, we need to be it need to be a commercial uh, uh, we need to be a business business wise decision. Then we can accept them in, in the incubator and uh, uh, give them some amount of money support to, su and support uh, to go out and try to find uh, a funding for, for their games or, or, or publishers to um, to release uh, the, the game uh, the game formally uh, and uh, f currently we're having one team uh, incubated in the in the Charles games with our silicon rights um, uh, they're really uh, cool, uh, cool cool guys and, and girls really uh, enthusiastic about about their game, so we think they will finish and really release uh, the game in the end. So Charles Games has become like a platform for for in-house Czech talent from Charles University that you can then share with your expertise of what you've managed to achieve with Attentat, and and help them push their 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 game their skills even further and further. Yep. Yep. So t tell tell me a bit about then about that general market. In the gaming, you said that it's highly competitive. Yeah. 
that you need to understand something about how business works to, to have some sort of success. I mean, you know, what, what kind of, are you now able, with the success you've had from Attentat, are, are you able now to sort of finance a decent number of attempts from, from students? Is, it, is there, a, is there a, you know, a decent amount of money in there that can support these projects? Um, not yet. <laughs> not yet. It's, it's, yeah. it's like, it's, 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 it's like, it's still like in the process. We are still, we are still very at the beginning and uh, uh, like we, s we still can't say that, you know, we can fully support our next game only from the money we are making on Attentat. Mm -hmm. That we are not there yet. And what are the sort of statistics in there? I mean, I mean, does it need, does a game need to be hugely popular to, to, to generate a significant amounts of money or, or, or is it? Actually, not uh, not that much. You don't have to like uh, sell a uh, million copies. Like um, uh, if you sell uh, one thousand, uh, one hundred thousand copies, uh, then the, the game is really really successful. If you sell like twenty to thirty uh, thousand copies, uh, then uh, it, it's pretty uh, pretty decent. Uh, so uh, it's really uh, about to start building community. Uh, fast uh, soon during during the process to to get get people into it. So once you launch uh, launch the game, uh, you will um, bridge the algorithms and get uh, high up uh, in the in the stores. So so, so, br so, so branding's point. important here. Yep. Uh, and and yep. I mean, does 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 the community? You you mentioned that you said the the word community. Mm. So does that mean that? Because I, I must I must declare I'm not much of a gamer. My, my, my my, my, my children enjoy playing computer games, so I, I've got a bit of, but I, I don't know too much. But so the, in this community, are, are, are people generally finding brands so the, the, and, and banking on that, well, I played one of their games and it was brilliant, so I'm going to download their next one. Is that, was that, is that what usually happens? It's, uh, kind of the thing is that currently there are really, there's a huge amount of games being released every day. So, so the, the competition, like the selection is really, really, really like wide, and many of them are brilliant and are simply not successful because they don't reach enough audience, you know, so, so that's, so, uh, it's like, it's all about, you know, uh, sometimes, of course, you follow, of course, if you have, like, community and people know that they like your games, and especially if it's a sequel, then yeah, then it's, like, much easier for you. But generally, it's, uh, there is, uh, like, marketing is a huge, uh, I would say, like, uh, very pivotal aspect of contemporary video game business. And the market is also highly fragmented. You have yeah. a lot of genres, uh, and you have players just playing some genres, some sub-genres sub, sub, sub even, and you're trying to find your position in the market and get uh, people yeah. like worldwide, which might be interested in your, uh, in your game through constantly interacting uh, through so social media to together the community. and. Um, Asking influencers is, is the, uh, whether they could like uh, re review review your, your game uh, to to build this kind of uh, network and prepare it for the for the launch in the end. But nevertheless, the, I, I like the concept that the brand's going to be built on these three pillars that you that you mentioned for for Charles' game. So, standing on those three pillars, this platform that you've generated. Let's 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 talk a bit about the future. So, what what can we expect? be coming from Charles Games in, in, in the near future? Well, we are actually currently working on a new game, uh, which is called Svoboda 1945 Liberation. And it's a game, uh, it's a sequel to Attentat 1942, and it's essentially, uh, it's telling the story of what happened after the war, and the, the war aftermath. So the, the, the game is happening in, in a small village called Svoboda, uh, in the Czech-German borderlands. And uh, uh, like Atedar was set in Prague, and this is deliberately set in, in the countryside. And uh, this village was uh, like everything would happen after the war, deeply influenced the life, uh, the life of the people there. So the game is talking about uh, the liberation from Nazism. Uh, it's talking about uh, the chaos and violence at the end of the war, like uh, that, that, uh, this, this uh, particular region was hit. It's talking about the, uh, the expulsion of the German-speaking citizens of Czechoslovakia, which after the war, uh, almost three and a half million uh, Germans were, or German-speaking citizens were expelled uh, from Czechoslovakia to Germany. And then it's talking about rise of communism to power. So that's like, because after, because after the after, after Second War, uh, a new actual era started, the era of Cold War. And uh, so the game is talking about the rise of communism and the coup d'etat in 1948 when the communists seized power. 
And then uh, what uh, heavily influenced the, the countryside and villages is the forced uh, collectivization, forced confiscation yes. of farmlands. And in this game, you're actually following the story of several families which lived in the village for, you know, for decades. And you see how uh, their, their relations and uh, family history were affected by, by these events. Now, the, the forced movement of German-speaking people after the, at the end of the Second World War, you mentioned three million odd or from, yep. from, from the Czech-German yeah. borderlands. That's, um, that's in many ways a far more controversial politically controversial uh, reality of history yep. than the 1942 assassination of, of, of Heinrich. Uh, so that, tell me a bit about that because that must have, you, you mentioned the, the complications of working with historians and, and coming to terms of what the storyline might be for Attentat. So this must have been, you know. Actually, uh, I, would say, so, so I would say this is actually, this topic is actually the topic where the format of the game uh, is actually, I would say, even more relevant than in Attentat, because the, the main feature of, uh, of our game is that we present you personal, uh, subjective stories, which are very from different points of view, you know, and you kind of talk to different people, and they tell radically different things. And in, kind of, in case of Attentat 1942, the, there was not that much more ambiguity, because you have the, you have the you know, Nazi regime, you have the, you have the uh, totalitarian regime and, you know, the, the atrocities, which is kind of mor morally very, uh, I would say, very clear. But in, in, uh, in, uh, in case of, you know, in case of uh, the expulsions or in, even in ca case of, you know, rise of communism, it's far, more, uh, it's far more interesting because it's, you know, not some kind of occupation power, but it's what happened in the Czech lands and what happened in our country uh, uh, where things were not, not, not clear. And that's where I would say uh, the different personal stories are kind of the best vehicle to, to present, to, to show you the complex reality without schematizing it. Mm. Because you can have very, so for example, you have like, you know, point of view of people who've been actively uh, involved as soldiers in the expulsion and they, 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 they fought the Nazis and then they kind of uh, are kind of defending why happened what happened and how, why it was historically necessary. You talk to people who've been expulsed or their families were expulsed. Then you talk to people who've been active communists and you talk to people who, whose family property was confiscated during communism, you know, and, and still many of these people still live in the same village and they have some relationships, which is kind of like uh, relevant to, to many, uh, many Czech villages. And, uh, and then the Velvet Revolution came, you know, when the property was written back to the owners, et cetera, et cetera. So, and you see all these things uh, through the lenses of very personal, personal family histories. Well, I'm going to be fascinated to play this eventually because, I, I mean, as, a, you know, as an Englishman, Living and living here in the Czech Republic for a lot for a long while now, certainly I feel that it's quite a taboo subject to, even today. So to, to to talk frankly with um, you know people who are uh, who who understand you know who who've lived through these these things, it's it's very difficult subject to approach. So I should imagine it must be. I don't know. At at school was it did, was is that a is that a, a part of Czech history, modern history, which is ten which schools tend to sort of skirt around really really depends i would say that really depends uh, i would say it's not that taboo any like it's not that uh taboo anymore like uh, there's a lot of documentaries and movies and, and fiction like and, and you know hist serious historical work being done on that field it's still it's still like ho hot issue for debates and contestation that's definitely yeah. true but uh i mean it really depends on school that there are like no today there are no set curricula for for uh, you know, for example for uh, for Czech high schools and secondary schools so you have some very broadly defined objectives yeah. you have to fulfill in, in during you, you know your teaching but there are no fixed you know rules you have to teach this and this and this so it really depends on the teachers okay and some of them we know like we know the game is actually uh, like the there's like an early version of the game which is tested in Czech high schools and it's quite successful uh, and, it's, and it's being used so okay so, so Fascinating storyline. That's the innovation in the storyline. Uh, Jakub, can you briefly tell me what we might expect in, in terms of innovation in the gaming experience? Uh, yeah, so, so with Attentat, I think we really you know, learned a lot about the craft of, uh, of, of game making. And we discovered uh, that the true potential of uh, our game uh, is, to, is to combine the, the strong narratives that we had uh, talked about uh, with some gameplay uh, elements which are really coming from, from the gaming itself. And so that's uh, what we are putting in a good use uh, in, in Foboda. Uh, we will be creating like uh, bigger 
mini games that will having like uh, in, in their source that they will be like a game like an economical game or, or a card game but it will be used uh, as um, as an engine for driving the narrative like there will be like for instance events and dialogues happening in in the course uh, of the of the longer longer mini game and uh, we think uh, this will uh, serve the, the purpose of the game like uh, showing um, how people uh, lived at the time even even more because you will be able to live like through a longer period of, of time like playing really playing it uh, for instance you will be trying to grow your your farming farming business and then the collectivization will uh, will came uh, by biting you back and then you will realize that you have been something actually building yourself and within the game yeah and then it's, it's over, you know. So, so that's uh, this kind of moments we will try to incorporate uh, into uh, into the Svoboda. Okay. So well, I'm sure all of you listening listening to us will be fascinated to take a sneak preview at this latest game, Svoboda Liberation. So, can I ask? Can we play the next clip? A little. <laughs> Když vám před očima zabijou kamaráda, tak na to nikdy nezapomenete. Pamatuju si, že teta si směla zabalit jen to nejnutnější. Kufry nesměly vážit víc než 50 kg a balila je pod dohlem českých vojáků. kde jsou ty hroby a kde je zakopali. Vykašlete se na ten průzkum, že třete si práci. Ta škola dělá ve vesnici zlou krev. Lidi nezajímá to, co bylo před 50 rokama. Lidi zajímá to, co bude zejtra. So that's Svoboda 1945 and Liberation. Gentlemen, thank you very much for that introduction and discussion about your, your games. Let's move on now to um, a chance for you all to uh, write in with some questions. There's already some on the screen here, and we can answer some of these directly. Okay, maybe if I, let's look at the first one here. The theme of the game, this is from Johan. The theme of the game is challenging. Are the reactions of not only players, but also the public, journalists to the game, just positive? So I think he's trying to ask, has, has there been any negative comments about that? Because we are dealing, after all, with, let's say, controversial topics. Well, uh, we've been quite surprised. Like, we've been, like, ready for... Uh, we've been expecting uh, some criticism, like, from, you know, various historians and, and from various, uh, various positions, and f it didn't really come. Uh, there, the, the reactions we got were overwhelmingly positive, uh, both from journalists and from, from reviewers and, and, and gamers. If there are some negative comments, they are mainly technical, like typically that the game is too short, or it's uh, that you know the quality of acting could be better, so, which which are kind of like general criticism. But there hasn't been some kind of fundamentally fundamental criticism of, for example, the topic or the way we approach history, which uh, again uh, because contemporary history is is is, uh, is or can be very contested topic. So we are kind of ready for and, and we, can, we are kind of ready for some debates and you know like discussions. And it didn't really happen. And the reasons might be, first, as I said, we had like six professional historians on the team who really tried to be as accurate as possible. And we had many heated debates in the team. So like yes. before we made the game, there were like very heated debates, what to include and how to write something. And essentially, mostly all historians agreed, okay, we'll do it that. Or if you will write that, then, then we have to add this kind of to make, you know, counterbalance it. So. Uh, the game is very, I would say, tries to be really sensitive. And also maybe uh, it's possible that for, I don't know, that it's like not a format people are used to, I don't know, you know, it, it's not easy to kind of grasp it as, as, as a game, as, as, a, as a medium for serious content. So maybe for some people it's not a 
platform for serious debate because uh, you know it's not a book or it's not a. Uh, but as I said, um, the there was mostly mostly no serious criticism, uh, surprisingly. Uh, so, but the you did mention there was some let's say suggestions about yep. how it could be technically better. Yep. Jakob, have you taken those those things to heart <laughs> and and have you you sort of use that in the next iteration for Svoboda? Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, we're trying, uh, or personally me, <laughs> I'm trying to stress the, the gaming part usually, or I'm seeing this. Uh, we have a historian so on, on the team that I should like counterbalance it in favor of, of, of gaming. And I think that's where we are striking the, the middle ground of, of really uh, having a more gameplay uh, un under the hood, but still with uh, relevant, uh, historically accurate, accurate content. So uh, yes, we are like watching uh, all the all the reviews and criticism, which is uh, coming back like the t technical ones, and we'll definitely uh, like targeting higher production value with with Svoboda because yeah, in so a market you need to be. But think you'll need to be better. <laughs> to get to those specific points, you said that they one person mentioned, or some some people have mentioned about the length. Yep. Quite so very 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 quick answers. Uh, uh, you know, what are your opinions? What should be a good length <laughs> for a, for a, for a, for such a such well, a game? You can finish the game at Nine Forty Two in like two or three hours, and yeah, I, I think the the story can be longer. Uh, so like, but uh, it's uh, it will never be like a game. You know, in, it's essentially a story, and once you play the game, you know the story, and for some people there is a replay value they want to play it differently and see, you know, if something happens when they make a different decision. There's different options about yeah. what, who yeah. you can ask what, right? Okay. But for most people I would say once the story is over, the game is over. Okay. Uh, so it does, doesn't really have uh, that much replay value. And also what was, actually, what was criticized but by... Has, has there been any sort of, I don't know, research on what our optimum... For games, so no. such sort of investigative, uh, you know, no, no. it's about value for the money. You know, when okay. a player is buy, buying the game, he's uh, usually checking, okay, if I pay a twenty dollar for for this, uh, mm. how much uh, like entertainment really like it, it, it'll get? Yeah. Because uh, there is there is a lot of research about you know optimum uh, length of of films, right? So they know that it, you know, so it's not always the the longer the better. Uh, well, so the the games are much more. I would say versatile than you know your typical movie, you like like you know small indie games which can be done in few seconds, and then you have like huge multiplayer games which you can play for for years seriously. So it's not really easy to say. But there was another criticism which was there was definitely that players wanted to have more control over the story, like they wanted to that their decisions would matter more in the game, and that's what we tried to okay. accommodate in okay. liberation. Let's move on to another question. Uh, so this is a general question. It's, the, it's an anonymous from an anonymous person, but uh, asking your opinions on the use of educational computer games in schools. So again, as as a parent of of, of children, who you you see how the the, the this the latest generation are very much um, interactive into through, well go through uh -huh. their computers. They're 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 in that space. They're in that that sort of uh, mode. So what do you think? Do we should should we be using computers more at school? Mm. Well. If I may, like we we are like working on we are developing educational games and doing research on actually the learning effect and effectivity of educational games for 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 more than a decade now, and so it's very hard to answer this briefly. But I try to be as brief as possible without. I, I will have to schematize a bit. So games can be awesome educational media, but only for some context and only f in only like for some specific you know tasks. So this, there are some things which can be better taught through frontal lecture. There are some things which can be better taught through games, and there are some things which should be better taught, you know, through reading or through, through doing some, some different activities. You know, I, I, and games generally are great in uh, enabling students to experiment in a safe environment with some complex system, especially where you can, you know, see the system from different point of view, and or, or for like you say, you can relive the same situation from different points of view and kind of make your own conclusion. And they are generally really good for retention, meaning that if you study some topic through game, you don't necessarily learn more than through other media uh, or through other means, but you remember it for, like you have better retention, you remember it for longer. And the answer is definitely like uh, games can have their role in education, but uh, uh, it, they are, as I said, they have to be specifically prepared very carefully for, uh, for the formal schooling context. So it definitely doesn't apply that you just take a game, you put it in the classroom, 
and you know it will make some some miracle. So that sounds if you you've actually been in discussion with teachers about this. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, well, before you tell me a bit about the teachers, uh, Jakob, what do you? Because you mentioned when we first met that you were, you know, you were, a, or you still are, a, quite a gamer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. what's your opinion? Do, do you do you think that there should be more? Uh, oh, one thing uh, when we have been doing those studies, the students also reported that uh, they had simply more fun learning through through the games. Of course, there is a novelty effect associated with that because it's, you know, but I still uh, think. Uh, uh, that's why it will uh, all have a place uh, in, in education. It's an interesting way of learning uh, new things, I think. So me personally, uh, I would welcome it. And uh, if uh, children can have some fun or be entertained while learning, uh, I think that's a good, <laughs> good to have in, in, in schools. Because for me, do you remember, I mean, when I think back to when I was a bit younger, there was always that discussion, because many films, were based on successful books. Mm. And then there would always be the discussion, what's, what is the better mm. experience? Read the book first, then watch the film. Yeah. <laughs> or watch the film first, realize that it's a good story, then read the book. And so in many, res in many respects, certainly in the Czech Republic, many people will, will, will have know a certain amount about whether it be the assassination of, of Heinrich or whether it be the, um, the forced movement of, of Germans after the, after the war. And so the question is going to be, is it, should, it, should their first contact be the gaming experience? Or, is it, or should there be, did the teachers say, have anything to say about that? Should there be, ah. first of all, let's say, a more traditional method of, of decimation of, 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 that, of that information? And, okay. then, and then the gaming experience? Okay, so just yep. short. Uh, I think mm, maybe the label like gaming is, is wrong. Yeah. You know, because it's really an interactive media. That's what is important. Uh, it, it does not necessarily need to be about entertainment and fun. It's no. about that. It's like a virtual reality almost. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's in interaction that, uh, that matters. And I think that's a very strong point, which is m missing in pretty much everywhere uh, else where you like uh, read, or watch, or, or, or uh, hear or someone speaking about that. Here, you really need to take part in the in the process, and I think that's unique. And uh, it, it um, uh, as a medium or tool for uh, for teaching, I, I think it has a place. Because if I'm if I'm thinking if I if I I mean I was I very much enjoyed history lessons back at school, and and I and I can distinctly remember as a student thinking, I'd love to be I'd love to go back and be in that yeah. in that moment. And if I'm thinking now about what you've been doing and the, and the possibilities of technology, if you, were to, if you were to marry what you've been doing with, say, technologies of virtual reality, mm -hmm. where you can actually be completely immersed in the world, the, the, the idea that you can actually see walking by you uh, Heinrich, coming out from his car or whatever it is, tapping on the shoulder, speaking for him to turn around and address you. So you can actually you know, be in that historical moment. moment. I mean, that seems to be an extremely powerful thing. I would like to say, again, to kind of reframe the question, and uh, the question like whether to, you know, read books, watch movies, or play games. Uh, I would say, you know, like, read good books, uh, watch good movies, and play good games. Yes. And, that's, <laughs> and the, the thing is, like, that there is still the perception that, you know, games are kind of, uh, kind of you know, like the lo sort of low culture medium because, because of the typical content. But th th this is really like a kind of a quite outdated perception. Like, there are s games are now very diverse. And you, you can like have games uh, on all topics and, and uh, with various quality. And definitely like uh, games are, as I said in the beginning, games, I believe games are a great medium for telling stories. Well, it seems to me that the realities are beginning to, to yep. merge. So virtual reality is emerging with our reality realities. We're seeing it almost everywhere, where there's no sort of linearity to what's really going on. And there's all sorts of possibilities there. It all seems to be part of the puzzle. Yep. Anyway, we're, really, we're rapidly running out of time, unfortunately. So let's have some quick fire questions with quick fire answers. Um, do you plan, gentlemen, to collaborate with other universities on similar but non-Czech uh, thematics? Uh, yes, uh, there is one project kind of on, in development, but we really can't talk about it. Stay tuned. <laughs> not, not, even, not even the theme? <laughs> nope. Not even the theme. Nope. Okay, but, this, but that's, again, so yep. it's from international. <laughs> Have you established any successful collaboration with any Czech game studio during game development? Mm. 
Well, uh, it's not like we collaborate uh, on a daily uh, daily basis. So basically, it's uh, all in-house development, but we are uh, in touch uh, with many through various conferences. Okay, th that's a sufficient answer. Uh, what in which languages in which language versions is the game available? Uh, it's uh, the audio is in Czech, and you can play it with English, German, and Russian subtitles. Okay, and do you plan to create a game about the year 1968 in the Czech Republic? Uh, yes, it's a tune pipeline. We are working on it right now. Okay, well, uh, I'm afraid that's what we're going to have to finish. There are a couple more questions, but they'll be maybe for next time. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I, I wish you all the success in your, in your current attentat and the futures for Boda and, and other further projects. So keep, keep trucking, keep going. Thanks. And uh, you all uh, out there, thank you very much for listening. This is... Um, it's been a pleasure to, to host this event. Um, it's the last event from, Czech, uh, from the, global Czech, uh, the Czech Center's uh, Global Science Cafe. We will be back next year, so uh, don't go away for too long. But in the meantime, have a wonderful and a very merry Christmas. Goodbye. Goodbye.